let's consider continue with part two of the presentation. I said before that definitions of war are inherently politicized. For example, the Holocaust, which killed 6 million Jews and several million others, is almost universally regarded as a crime against humanity. But the Nazis regarded it as this final solution, as they called it, as the central element in what they regarded as a state-sponsored campaign of systematic extermination, essentially a war. In a July 1943 speech to SS officers, SS Chief Heinrich Himmler all but said so outright. We have the moral right, we had the duty to our people to kill this people who would kill us, he told the assembled officers. Um, and to have seen this through and to re have remained decent has made us hard and is a page of glory, never mentioned and never to be mentioned, never mentioned or to be mentioned because the Nazis expected to keep the final solution a permanent state secret. Here's another example. The security camera footage at a Walmart in El Paso, Texas, taken on August 4th, 2019, shows a 21-year-old shooter who drove four hours uh, to reach that particular Walmart in the well-founded belief that most of its customers would be Hispanic. He killed 20 people and wounded 26. Before committing the act, he placed on the internet a manifesto that framed his action as an act of war uh, on behalf of what he viewed as a white race in danger of being overwhelmed by non-whites. He viewed himself as one soldier in a larger conflict, saying that he had been inspired by another self-appointed fighter, a white supremacist who five months previously had attacked two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, killing 51 worshipers and wounding another 40. The man had posted his own manifesto online. Both men were adherents to a white supremacist theory known as the Great Replacement, which postulates an intentional conspiracy to replace white majority populations in the United States, France, and elsewhere with non-whites through policies that encourage mass migration and, uh, and a low white birth rate. Now, is this an example of a war? The two shooters clearly viewed themselves as combatants in a war, but we would reject that, um, uh, that interpretation, surely. But there's another angle. While both shooters were criminally indicted for murder and attempted murder, their acts have been likened to terrorism because of their explicitly political motivation. In this respect, they are similar to self-radicalized individuals who committed mass murder in the name of ISIS, stands for the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. To give you an idea of what ISIS was like, this photograph shows an ISIS mass execution in progress. For a time, this terrorist group controlled a large expanse of Iraq and Syria. Their rise tracked back directly to the US invasion of Iraq, which created a power vacuum in the region that ISIS was able to exploit. Now, among the self-radicalized terrorists was the shooter who in June 2016 killed 49 people and wounded 53 more at a gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida. Just before the attack, he proclaimed his allegiance to ISIS. It isn't clear whether this was his real motivation. He was both mentally ill and homophobic, but ISIS sympathizers reacted by praising this attack on pro-Islamic state forums. To give one further example of self-radicalized terrorism, on July 14th, 2016, a Tunisian man drove a truck at high speed into a French crowd celebrating Bastille Day, the French equivalent of the 4th of July. The attack killed 86 people and wounded 458. The man was killed by police, so it could not be determined for sure that he was self-radicalized, but investigations showed no known affiliations with terrorist organizations. 
ISIS did not formally take credit for the attack, but an ISIS news agency termed the man, quote, a soldier of the Islamic State, end quote. Finally, let's examine one further event that suggests both how definitions of war are inherently politicized and also the difficulty of clearly defining what war is and is not. I refer to the storming of the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. You already know what happened, and because it's still a recent event in American political life, it offers a vivid example of the way in which definitions of war are inherently politicized. I don't mean to say that the event is an example of war, but Democrats have tended to call the event by a name that pushes it in the direction of war and insurrection, while Republicans have tended uh, to avoid giving it any particular uh, characterization, but might settle for riot. Certainly, they have used a whataboutism that equates what happened at the Capitol with the riots that broke out uh, at some of the Black Lives Matter protests in the summer of 2020. Now, if you're offended by the very idea that the storming of the Capitol has any place in a history of war course, you're getting the point. So too, if you feel delighted by its inclusion, inclusion you're also getting the point. But stepping back from politics, and trying to view things objectively, what should one call the storming of the Capitol? The answer is difficult because the event belongs in the borderlands of war. Now, what do I mean by borderlands? Most of the world's political borders have an artificiality to them. You will find people on both sides of these borders who speak the language of the other country, who share folkways, cuisines, and who engage in extensive economic interaction. For that reason, it makes much more sense to speak of a borderland rather than a neatly articulated frontier. One reason the El Paso shooter targeted that city is that it was itself part of a larger borderland community. Its population is 80% Hispanic. Just across the Rio Grande is the city of Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, and just to the west is the city of Las Cruces, New Mexico. These three cities interact so extensively that they are often considered to be a single metropolitan area called Paso del Norte or the border plex. The area has a population of 2.7 million and has the largest bilingual, binational workforce in the Western Hemisphere. So when we think of war conceptually, it's useful to think metaphorically of the borderlands of war, types of violence that may not be war, but have features in common with war. The storming of the US Capitol has two features that point it in the direction of war. First, the objective of those who stormed the US Capitol that day was explicitly political. Secondly, those who played a disproportionately large role in the event were paramilitary groups that had planned to storm the Capitol and wore combat attire and use military type communication methods to coordinate their attack and employed military tactics. With regard to the political objective, January 6th was the date when Congress would certify the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. The thousands of supporters of President Donald J. Trump who came to a rally in Washington that day, shown here, were convinced that the 2020 presidential election had been stolen, that Trump remained the rightful US president. And for that reason, they sought to prevent the certification of Joe Biden's election as the 46th president of the United States. This was a mere constitutional formality, but Trump's supporters had been told by President Trump himself that Vice President Mike Pence, who would preside over the certification, could refuse to do so and could refuse successfully if enough members of Congress backed him up. This was the overriding theme of Trump's speech at the rally, which he concluded by telling the thousands of supporters in attendance, we're going to walk down to the Capitol. We're going to cheer on our brave senators, and congressmen, and women. 
we're probably not gonna be cheering so much for some of them because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. President Trump didn't walk down to the Capitol, he went back to the White House, but well over a thousand supporters did and hundreds attacked the US Capitol Police, ultimately breaking through the police cordon and entering the Capitol itself. Many of them telling the overwhelmed police officers, Trump sent us. Among the crowd were members of at least five paramilitary organizations that had come to Washington intent on storming the Capitol, most notably the Oath Keepers shown here. This gets at the second commonality, organized military action. Of the hundreds of Trump supporters who engaged in fighting with the police and entered the Capitol, most had not come to the rally with the intention of storming the US Capitol. They sort of just got caught up in the, in the action. But some clearly did. And among these was a paramilitary group called the Oath Keepers, who pre-planned the storming and conducted it as a military operation. The Oath Keepers consisted of former law enforcement officers and military veterans who understood military planning, communication, and tactics. They coordinated their operation with walkie-talkies and used a military tactic tailor-made to break into the Capitol. The tactic is called stacking, and it calls for a tactical team to line up on a door or corner in very close proximity with one man right behind the next. At left, you see US paratroopers using the stack formation as they practice entering a building occupied by the enemy. At right, you see Oath Keepers using the identical stack formation as they move up the Capitol steps toward one of the entrances. Now to repeat, the Oath Keepers were among at least five paramilitary groups known to have been present in the storming of the Capitol. These were essentially the spearhead that breached the Capitol entrances and enabled other Trump supporters to get inside. A member of the Oath Keepers paramilitary group who was charged with conspiracy in connection with the Capitol riot claimed to be coordinating with the Proud Boys and the far right self-styled militia called the Three Percenters to form an alliance on January 6th. What happened on January 6th? What should we call it? The crowd fought through a barricade manned by US Capitol Police and entered the Capitol at 1.30 p.m. For almost three hours, they roamed its halls and entered both the House and Senate chambers and vandalized offices. At 4.17 p.m., President Trump uploaded a video telling his supporters who had breached the Capitol, quote, I know your pain, I know your hurt. We had an election that was stolen from us, but you have to go home now. We have to have peace. We have to have law and order. This was a fraudulent, fraudulent election, but we can't play into the hands of these people. We have to have peace, so go home. We love you, you're very special. I know how you feel, but go home and go home in peace." End quote. Around 5.40 p.m., a contingent of National Guardsmen arrived to assist the Capitol Police and Washington Metropolitan Police in clearing the building, which was pronounced secure at 7.30 p.m. In the weeks afterward, the FBI conducted a major investigation to identify the protesters who had ent entered the Capitol. As of mid-August 2021, 570 people allegedly involved in the event had been arrested and 40 people were facing conspiracy charges by federal prosecutors. But what exactly had they done? Or to put it another way, what are we to call the storming of the Capitol on January 6th? I have purposely used the term storming because it conveys the sense of the violence, but does not specifically define what occurred. Was it a riot, which under federal law is essentially a tumultuous disturbance of the public peace by which three or more, more persons assemble together and act with common intent? Or was it an, an insurrection, a term swiftly and widely used in the media? The Department of Defense Dictionary of Military Terms does not define insurrection, or for that matter, riot. 
notwithstanding the fact that the National Guard is charged with controlling riots. And the dictionary does define riot control agent, basically tear gas. Nor is insurrection defined in the US law code, although it recognizes the concept. The federal law states that whoever incites, sets on foot, assists or engages in any rebellion or insurrection against the authority of the United States or the laws thereof, or gives aid or comfort thereto, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years or both, and shall be incapable of holding any office under the United States. Well, that sounds just like what these people did, except that most um, legal experts believe that as a practical matter, it would be nearly impossible to actually convict someone under this statute. And indeed, for the most part, federal prosecutors have charged participants with what might roughly be called criminal trespass and disorderly conduct. And that's because while there's a law against um, uh, getting involved with an insurrection, there's no definition about what an insurrection actually is. In fact, the law that's on the book goes back all the way to, um, uh, to uh, uh, the early 20th century. And then the Insurrection Act, which is the closest thing we have to a military definition of insurrection, goes back to 1807. So insurrection is not a very helpful uh, concept in, um, in legal terms. But insurrection has a well-known ordinary meaning. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines the word as, quote, an act or instance of revolting against civil authority or an established government. Now, this comes reasonably close to the Department of Defense definition of insurgency, which is the organized use of subversion and violence by a group or movement that seeks to overthrow or force change of a governing authority. The hundreds of Trump supporters who entered the Capitol did so with the intent of preventing the certification of Joe Biden's election as president, which if successful would have very definitely have forced change in a governing authority. And as we've seen, paramilitary organizations like the Oath Keepers came to the Capitol wearing military gear and using military tactics to breach the Capitol. So to that extent, we have an organized use of violence. I would nonetheless argue that the storming of the Capitol was not an act of insurgency, although these paramilitary groups view themselves as prepared to conduct an insurgency. But it wasn't a riot either. Perhaps one could call it an organized riot, but that's not a very satisfactory answer. If by now you're not at all sure how to define war, then I've done my job. I think that war essentially defies definition. It is too complex. It takes too many forms. It is too politically charged. What one group regards as war, another regards as terrorism, while another regards it as criminal activity. This photo underscores my point. This is a photo taken uh, at Guantanamo Bay uh, Prison. It shows captives uh, there, and the captives are there as a result of a political complexity that after 9-11 tied the U.S. government in knots, and it's the same uh, political complexity that I just described, you know, what one group regards as war, another regards as terrorism, another regards it as criminal activity. Um, to sidestep this whole issue, the U.S. government created the, ca the category of illegal enemy combatant. The illegal denied enemy combatants the status of prisoners of war, but combatant implied that they were not mere criminals um, and were therefore not subject to due process, in which federal prosecutors would have to prove their guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, which would have required the disclosure of uh, significant military intelligence or other sensitive information. As for the Al-Qaeda members, most closely associated with the 9-11 attacks, the Bush administration was particularly intent to avoid treating them either as combatants or as criminals. It needed, as an attorney advisor to the US State Department put it, the legal equivalent of outer space it found this in Guantanamo Bay prison. 
which is controlled by the U.S. military, but located in Cuba. The United States took a portion of Cuba, an extreme southeastern part of it, after the Spanish-American War and has kept it ever since. So you have Guantanamo Bay prison. It's uh, controlled by the U.S. military, but it's located in Cuba, where it was argued constitutional legal protections did not apply. Now, I maintain that war defies definition, and I hope that by now I've given you a pretty good idea of why I think that's the case. But I'm in a distinct minority. Most military theorists and historians have come up with very neat and clear definitions of war. The best known of these is the one given by the Prussian military theorist Karl von Clausewitz in his famous treatise on war, published in 1832. He wrote, war is a continuation of policy by other means. In German, the word politik can stand for either politics or policy. So it is also accurate to translate the definition as war is a continuation of politics by other means. And if you squint really hard and want to see it badly enough, this definition, war is a continuation of politics by other means, would seemingly be a perfect fit for the storming of the capital. But Clausewitz was a Prussian general who fought during the Napoleonic Wars. And although he framed his definition in universal terms, and too many military historians uncritically accept this, essentially, he was thinking about conventional wars between two or more countries. As for policy by other means, he meant that countries normally attempt to get what they want through diplomatic negotiation. But when they cannot get what they want this way, they may turn to violence as an additional tool of negotiation, as additional leverage. Now, Clausewitz doesn't make that this clear. The idea is actually better expressed by Thomas Schelling, one of the best known American strategic analysts of the 20th century. The power to hurt, he once wrote, is bargaining power. To exploit it is diplomacy, vicious diplomacy, but diplomacy. Now I would argue, and in fact I have argued, that war, that war is a form of negotiation, not just at the strategic level, but at the tactical level as well. I made this point in a film column I wrote about the harrowing 20 minute scene of the desperate fight for control of Omaha Beach that opens director Steven Spielberg's superb film, Saving Private Ryan. And the column is one of your required readings this week. But although I ultimately resist any definition of war, if you insist, that I give you a definition, it would be this. It comes from my friend, John F. Gilmartin Jr., who taught military history at Ohio State from 1987 until his death in 2015 at age 75. John F. Gilmartin Jr., Joe to his friends, nobody ever called him John. His father was John, yeah, he was Joe. Joe was, in addition to being a professor a retired U.S. Air Force Colonel, Vietnam veteran, and a two-time recipient of the Silver Star uh, for Courage Under Fire. He had what he modestly called a working definition of war. It is similar to that of Clausewitz, but more detailed. Now read it carefully. War is the use of organized, socially sanctioned, armed violence to achieve a political, social or economic objective. War is organized violence to distinguish it from, from, um, from, un from unorganized or spontaneous violence like riots. Armed violence is self-explanatory. Although I would argue that this definition excludes nonviolent resistance, which I firmly regard as a form of war for reasons I'll get to in the future. With regard to objectives, Clausewitz mentioned only a political objective. Professor Gil Martin added social to encompass wars fought on behalf of religion or to achieve some other form of social change and economic 
because sometimes the objective of a war is the acquisition of strategic resources or wealth. 